it over. Uh, so, no, not verbatim, but I'll just do the, the quick, I'm Michael Osman, Great Scott Gadgets, and uh, I make hardware for hackers. And um, I was so excited about Software Defined Radio when I first got into it or first learned about it because I could make radios out of software. And um, uh, so several, fast forward a few years, and my latest creation is this. Uh, it's not software. <laughs> it's hardware. And this is because, uh, as it turned out, as it turned out, that the tools at the time were not quite what I hoped they would be. And the more I got into software-defined radio, the more I got into hardware. And I learned hardware just so that I could build pro radio projects like this one. Um, and uh, so I'll just introduce you to this a little bit. This is HackRF Jawbreaker, and I have a unit right here uh, that I'll be showing, demonstrating today a little bit. Um, it's a very wideband open source hardware platform for general purpose software defined radio. Uh, it transmits and receives which is something that a lot of SDR devices don't do, uh, that a lot of them are receive only. Uh, it operates over an extremely wide frequency range from 30 megahertz to six gigahertz. Uh, this is wider than any other device I've ever seen for less than several thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, all, everything's on board. Everything, all you need is an antenna and a USB cable. So, uh, so it's a very wide operating range. It's a transceiver. It has a fairly high sample rate, up to 20 mega samples per second, uh, which is about 10 times what you get from uh, like the, the TV tuner dongles that have become popular for SDR. Um, and most importantly, it's all open source. It's open source hardware. It's open source software. And I started this project primarily because there was no open source solution. And I wanted there to be an open source solution. I think that the, you know, the world needed an open source hardware solution for general purpose SDR. And uh, so right now, I'm shipping beta units. And uh, hopefully, there'll be, I'll be able to have a commercial release coming up pretty soon. But um, uh, really, today, I'm not talking about HackRF much, except that I, uh, it's the platform that I'm using because I designed it and I like it. Uh, but uh, mostly uh, today I'm talking about the software side of Software Defined Radio. And hopefully some of you are in the same boat that I was in several years ago, excited about SDR because you're software people and you can use this technology to build all sorts of interesting radio systems out of software and not have to mess with the hardware. Uh, I think that, that that dream can finally become a reality. Uh, it wasn't for me six or seven years ago, uh, but it could be for you now that thanks to new tools, new hardware tools like HackRF, um, thanks to, to the continuing developments and maturity of software tools like GNU Radio, uh, today you can get into this stuff and learn how to build uh, radio systems pretty much entirely in software. And I think that's really exciting. Uh, the, the potential for improving the state of the art in radio systems in general, um, coming up with new ways to communicate with each other, um, figuring out strengths and weaknesses in existing radio communication systems. Um, I think there's a lot of potential for um, uh, covert communications and encrypted communications that, that haven't been realized in the past. Um, there's all kinds of interesting stuff that can be done and can now be done uh, in software. So um, for the rest of our time together here, mostly I just want to do some demos and show you how I work with GNU Radio and HackRF and um, give you some ideas for uh, kind of the, the fundamental concepts. Basically, I'm going to try to tell you all the things that I wish somebody told me the first day that I started working with SDR. So uh, those are my slides. Yay, two slides.
I'm going to uh, just fire up GNU Radio Companion here and start showing you around. So GNU Radio Companion is a uh, GUI tool. Now I'll tell you right now, I hate GUIs. Um, I, you know, this is my window manager <laughs> and I use keyboard commands all the time. I hate GUIs, but I love GNU Radio Companion. GNU Radio Companion is an amazing tool that uh, gives you a way to, to build stuff with GNU Radio. You can build stuff with GNU Radio in other ways. You can build stuff with C++. You can build stuff with Python. You can build stuff with a mix of languages. Or you can build stuff just in GRC, GNU Radio Companion. And it's the easiest way to experiment with GNU Radio. So let me show you an example. Um, it's a, it's a, a, a um, canvas upon which you draw a graph, a flow graph, of how data flows through your application. So, and, and taking uh, cues from engineering, it uses this terminology of sources and sinks. So you have like a source of information uh, at the beginning of your flow and a sink of information at the end of your flow. It's a destination for the information. I'm going to sit down here so I can use my laptop a little more easily. Um, so if I want to receive some radio signals with HackR app, I'll start my flow graph with a source that is a HackRF source. Or in this case, uh, I'll look in the sources on the right there, and I'll pull out an Osmo SDR, uh, Osmocom source. Uh, Osmocom is a, a group of uh, open source developers in Europe, primarily. And they have developed this Osmocom source that actually supports multiple different hardware backends. So instead of having just a HackRF source, I'm using the more general purpose Osmocom source that works with TV tuner dongles, for example, and other, uh, other SDR peripherals. But it also supports the HackRF. Uh, if you guys want to come in and take a seat over here, there's, there's room. Feel free. I don't think anybody will mind too much. Uh, so I'm going to um, use this Osmocom source. And if I look. If I double click on it, it brings up these properties and lets me set all sorts of different things. Note that it, it tells me right here, Great Scott Gadgets, HackRF Hack is supported. Um, but um, there are a few things that I need to set right off the bat. One of them is the sample rate. Um, notice that right here, it's configured, in, it's not configured with a number. Like I wouldn't set this to 8 million samples per second. I could just type in 8 million right here. But instead, I can just leave it as a variable name and then go edit this variable called samp rate. And I'll set this to 8 million or 86. And now notice that the Osmocom source is going to default to 8 million because it's referring to that variable. Any place uh, you have uh, one of these fields that can take a variable, it can actually take a, any Python expression, which can get kind of crazy, but uh, it's a very powerful um, tool. And then the other thing I really need to set, probably, uh, I'm going to set my RF gain a little bit uh, so that it turns on the front end amp. And then I'm going to set a frequency, an operating frequency. So uh, one, one frequency range that I know we can find some interesting things in is the 2.4 gigahertz band that has things like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and Zigbee. So, um, but it's kind of handy to be able to move the frequency around. So instead of just, I could just set this to like 2450E6, that would be 2.45 gigahertz. Um, or, well, let's just do that for now. And then I'll show you how we can move that around a little bit. Now, the easiest way to, to find out that we're getting a valid signal is to visualize it. And if I go down into these GUI widgets and pull out a WX, uh, oh, I'm having to relearn my way around because can you, this all changed recently, like yesterday. Um, instrumentation, WX, FFT sync is what I'm interested in. The FFT, some of you have probably heard of, is an algorithm for uh, determining the frequency domain characteristics of a signal. So it's converting a time-varying signal 
into something that that we can visualize uh, uh, how much of each different frequency components is, is uh, present in a signal, like a spectrum analyzer or like a graphic equalizer and an audio system, that kind of a view. Um, so all I'm going to do is take some RF data that comes from the Hack RF. It's going to be tuned to 2.4 gigahertz, and it's just going to digitize a bunch of radio uh, signals at 2.45 gigahertz, send them over the USB, and then I'm going to plot them using an FFT in real time. Uh, let's just give that a try and see what happens. Uh, it's prompting me to uh, create a file name here. And there we go. So there are a few characteristics that I'd like to point out. Um, one is that the frequency in megahertz is centered at zero. This may be a little strange to you if you've never heard of negative frequencies. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But think of it for now as being relative to the frequency that I tuned to. So this is really 2.45 gigahertz minus one megahertz, right? It's just a relative frequency. Also notice that the overall width or the bandwidth that we're analyzing here goes from negative four to four, so that's eight megahertz. It's eight megahertz because I configured the HackRF to give me samples at a rate of eight million per second. Eight million samples per second, with quadrature sampling that we use on most of these types of devices, gives us eight megahertz of bandwidth. It's very simple that way. If, we, if I increase the sample rate to 10 mega samples per second, then we'd see 10 megahertz of bandwidth. It's directly related. Um, another thing I'd like to point out is there's this very prominent feature in the middle. There's that big spike, and that's just basically a defect. Um, it's, it's very common with this type of quadrature sampling that we're doing to have what we would call a, what we call a DC offset. Um, and that is just a spike centered at zero. We we'll, Hopefully we'll find some ways to reduce that, but we'll probably never completely eliminate it. There's always the potential to have somewhat of a spike in the middle. So most of the time, I just leave it there and ignore it. Um, now, what's actually going on? Do you see how the, we get these wideband bursts fairly often? I mean, if I set this peak hold, you'll see, see how we pretty often get these bursts that go across most or all of the whole bandwidth? Um, anybody have any guess as to what those might be? Wi-Fi, packets. Yes, in fact, together you are correct. They are Wi-Fi packets. Um, Wi-Fi uh, uses modulation that are um, at a minimum about 20 megahertz wide. Well, we're only looking at an eight megahertz wide view and we're looking in the 2.4 gigahertz band where we would expect to see Wi-Fi. And so most of the bursts that we're seeing are probably Wi-Fi packets that we're only seeing part of really in the frequency domain. Um, let's, uh, let's try something a little different, like um, let me try tuning the frequency in real time. Now I'm going to add, remember uh, I, can, I, can tune, I can set one of these things to a variable. So instead of setting this to 2.45 gigahertz, I'll just set it to a variable called freak, which doesn't exist yet, which is why this is red and angry. Um, but if I go in here and I take my GUI widgets and I find uh, WX slider, I can create a slider and call it freak. And I'll set the default to 2450E6. And I'll, I'll, let's say, let's tune anywhere in the 2.4 gigahertz band. So I'll set the minimum to 2.4 and the maximum to 2.5. And yeah, that's fine. I'll do one megahertz uh, steps. Now, my flow graph isn't angry anymore because I've defined that variable freak. And if I launch this, it should look pretty much the same except I have this slider across the top. And now I can change frequency that I'm tuned to. Notice as I move around, I still get a lot of the same stuff. I'm still getting these wideband bursts pretty often because they're happening at various points throughout the 2.4 gigahertz band. But also notice that that DC offset, that spike in the middle, stays constant, right? Because that's 
that's an artifact of my receiver system, not any real over-the-air signal. So if I set this up kind of in the high end of the 2.4 gigahertz band, um, uh, this is, well, theoretically, I'd be getting less Wi-Fi activity because I'm up above the, or at the highest Wi-Fi channel. But um, let me just see if I can pick up some Bluetooth. I'm going to turn on Bluetooth on my phone, which is something I don't do very often. In fact, I think I only do it when I give talks uh, for demonstration. Um, if I scan for devices with my Bluetooth phone, now one thing that's very handy, did anybody see some, some bursts that are more narrow? Now it might be hard to see with peak hold because of the, um, because of the Wi-Fi packets. But a trick that I use a lot is like put something at super close range because then you can often see, see those, here's a burst right there, and here was a burst right there, and here was a burst right there. You can often see characteristics or confirm that a signal is, is coming from the device that you're interested in, right? If you just get really close and you get these huge peaks, well, you know that you're, you're picking up the, the thing that was close. Um, because uh, the closer things are, you know, there's a much, much higher power uh, received signal. So now we're getting a combination of some Wi-Fi stuff and some Bluetooth stuff. We're getting these broad Wi-Fi packets that raise our whole floor up. But when we're also sometimes getting these Bluetooth packets that are more narrow. Uh, Bluetooth uses a modulation that only is one megahertz wide, not 20 megahertz wide. And it's frequency hopping, which means some packets are at one frequency, some packets are another frequency. It jumps around. Every single packet is a, a new frequency in this 2.4 gigahertz band. Um, so it makes sense that we would see multiple bursts from the same device, all about one megahertz wide, um, and spaced uh, one megahertz apart, or in this case, it looks like the ones we got were two megahertz apart uh, from each other. So I'm just going to show you, now, now hopefully you get the sense that this, this tool, GNU Radio Companion, isn't really, um, it, it isn't designed so that you can build awesome GUIs. It's designed so that you can rapidly prototype um, and experiment with this stuff, and that's what's so great about it. Um, but I want to show you what it does behind the scenes. Um, when I click this button up here, execute the flow graph, what actually happens is it compiles this flow graph to a Python program and then executes the Python. Let's take a look at that Python. How many of you guys know Python a little bit? How many of you know C++? Okay, great. So uh, with GNU Radio, like I mentioned earlier, you can write applications in C++. You can write applications in Python. You can build applications just solely in GNU Radio Companion if you want. And in all cases, very similar things happen. Uh, let's take a look at the, at the code that was produced. Um, it should have created in my home directory this program called topblock.py. And uh, you'll see this was created uh, June 19th, just now. So. Um, if I edit this file and scroll all the way down, oh, it's 117 lines long. Okay, so this program that had my HackRF source, my Osmocom source talking to the HackRF, and this FFT sync, um, including all the GUI elements, you know, and my slider and everything, is this program that's 100 some lines long. Um, and it's really pretty simple. Let me uh, try to make this a little bit easier to read. Is that better? Um, so I'm just going to show you, it imports a bunch of stuff, it has this top block, which is kind of the top of the hierarchy, and it sets some variables like sample rate and frequency, those, so those are the default values for those. Uh, then it creates blocks. Now a block is something like this, or this, there are, those are two blocks that are connected to each other. And so if the cool thing about GNU Radio Companion, or one of the cool things, is that it produces this Python code for you, and then you can use that to learn how to write Python code using for GNU Radio. Um, and it's super simple. Um, 
you set up a block. Here's a block that is a text box. Here's a block that is a frequency slider. Um, and uh, the real blocks that do signal processing are the FFT sync. It just has a bunch of uh, you know, parameters that are set for it. Um, and then there is a GR Osmo SDR source block, which is, uh, which is what is talking to the uh, HackRF and then is setting all its defaults. And then it connects them together. Connections. Connect the Osmo SDR source to the FFT sync. It's really, really a simple syntax. You, you define a block, set its parameters, you define another block, set its parameters, and you connect them together in a directed graph. Um, and then there's a few functions that it's defined for getting and setting the variables that we configured. Um, so if we had, if we left out the stuff with the variables, and if we had, uh, uh, you know, this would be very, very short, simple. Most of the code in here, like most of the lines of code, are actually devoted to the GUI. Okay, uh, there isn't much work you have to do just to to instantiate blocks and string them together with those connect lines. Now, so this this is a way that you can learn to write Python code for GNU Radio. Now, you might be interested in writing C++ code for GNU Radio. It's not very different. The Python uh, for GNU Radio is actually derived from the C++. It uses SWIG to produce Python bindings for C++ blocks. The actual computation being done by this FFT sync is being done in a in compiled C++ code. And it's just getting called from Python, which helps make this whole thing very fast, even when you are running it in Python. Uh, signal processing of this nature, when you're dealing with millions of samples per second, is a pretty intense uh, thing. You know, computers are only fairly recently capable of doing, doing this kind of thing, like general purpose computers for millions of samples per second. I mean, you might remember back in the 90s when we had kind of this explosion of, of digital signal processing for audio on home computers. Right Before that, um, we didn't have things like hard disk recording. We didn't have things like MP3 files. Um, because we didn't have general purpose computers that could just do that stuff natively uh, that were fast enough and had the audio hardware to do that. We're doing the same thing today with radio that we were doing 15 years ago or so uh, with audio. Um, we just need a sound card that's about a thousand times faster and <laughs> a machine that's about a thousand times faster uh, and antennas instead of microphones and speakers. Right? It's basically the same kind of technology. It's just a lot faster. So it's helpful that GNU Radio does this stuff. Almost everything it does, all of the intense computation, is being done in compiled C++ code, even when you're using the Python interface uh, to that code, and even when you're using the GNU Radio companion interface to build the Python. Uh, it's all, it all fits together. So. You know, one of the things that I wish somebody told me about the first day I started with GNU Radio or with software radio in general um, is that digital signal pro just because I know software doesn't mean I know digital signal processing. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot to learn about DSP. And um, it, it's generally where I see people uh, struggle because I, I see people come into software radio from one of two directions. Either they're radio people who get into software radio, or they're software ra people who get into software radio. And uh, I, I was definitely in the, the, the second group. Like I was a software guy who got into software radio. And I've had to learn a lot of radio stuff, and I've had to learn a lot of DSP stuff. Uh, radio people who get into software radio, uh, they have to learn a whole lot of software stuff, uh, including DSP. And, um, uh, I think that software people have the advantage. Um, the, there's more complicated stuff to know about software and making computers do things uh, than I think there is essential knowledge about radio waves and how they get in and out of antennas and so forth. Um, 
personally, that's my opinion, that software people have the advantage versus radio people. But all people can learn this stuff. And no matter which side you come from, you're probably going to have to learn some digital signal processing. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the things that I find very interesting about, um, about the, you know what, I'm going to give you a little bit more of a demo here before, uh, before I expound any further. Uh, I'm just going to show you, like, we found some Wi-Fi packets that we know were incomplete. But we found some Bluetooth packets that were probably complete. Um, how do we actually like get from a radio waveform to bits? Uh, because once we get the bits, like the actual bits that are contained in the packet, hey, if you're software people, you probably can figure out what to do with those. But getting from the radio waveform to the bits is the hard part. That's like the deep mystery that most people have coming into this. Um, so let me, and I'm not going to have time to explain everything in great detail, but let me just give you kind of a demo of how that sort of thing can be done. So um, right now I'm just visualizing an FFT so I can see that a signal exists at a certain frequency. But let me try to actually pull some information out of that signal. Um, the first thing I'm going to do um, is now is try to get, um, try to find a frequency where things are interesting. So we know that we know that I'm getting, for example, occasional packets at this frequency. I'm getting occasional packets at this frequency. Um, but I don't seem to be getting packets right there. And even if I were, I have that DC offset that potentially could cause problems for me. Um, so I'm just going to avoid it. And maybe I'll focus on this frequency right here, which is 1 megahertz higher than my center. So I want to shift everything. It would be nice if I could shift everything so that I'm centered on that particular frequency. Uh, there are a couple ways I could do that. I could do it in hardware. I could change the, the freak value, right? Um, like, uh, I think I was having, well, that, seem, that seems to be fine, 2.45. Um, I'm going to, but I'm going to shift it in software. And the way we shift a frequency in software is very uh, conceptually very simple. If, uh, but, but it may be math that you're not familiar with, um, I am going to multiply the signal by a complex exponential. Uh, so I need a multiplier, there we go, math operators, and I'm creating this signal source going into one input of the multiplier, and I'm taking my signal from the HackRF into the other, and I'm just multiplying one by the other. And what this is is a point by point multiplication. So there's one value, one sample from one input, and then a sample taken from the other input, and they're multiplied together. All these things, every place where you see an input or an output and these connections between them, they're just they're digital signals, which means they're just sequences of numbers that represent a waveform uh, or samples. So I'm going to change this to minus 1e6 minus. Uh, and this may be a little mysterious. What is a negative frequency? Uh, but if I run this, you'll see, notice, where's the DC offset? I've shifted the entire signal down by one megahertz. And I've done it in the digital domain, not in the analog domain. Uh, I've done this on the computer. I haven't changed my configuration of the HackRF at all. Same bits coming over the USB, more or less. Uh, or same types of waveforms. Um, but now what was at one megahertz is now at zero. And what was at zero is now at one. Um, and then I'm going to filter it. Now let me show you the effects of a filter. Um, I would like to take a low pass filter, which in this case, since I have positive and negative frequencies, uh, kind of gives me a band of plus and minus some, some uh, range around zero. I'm going to set my cutoff frequency to 500 kilohertz and my transition to 500 kilohertz and see what this looks like. Now this should start to look quite different. Aha! Now you might be starting to see where I'm going with this. This signal level is about the same as what we saw before. 
but everything outside or greater than certain dif uh, difference, uh, greater than a certain amount from zero uh, is now getting filtered out or knocked down. Um, and if I, uh, if I auto scale here, you can see how much there's a big drop off from here to here of many dB. Um, notice I still have a DC offset here that's been shifted down but also knocked down so that it's not as high relative to the signal that I'm interested in. And if I were to, um, if I were to use my Bluetooth device and set peak hold, I'll probably see from time to time Now this is something else that I wish somebody told me about on day one. Um, this display and many displays that you will see when dealing with SDR. Oh, that was a Bluetooth packet, I think. Um, this display doesn't tell you all the information. Okay, Take a look at the configuration for this block, the FFT sync. Refresh rate, 15. That means it's displaying a graph 15 times per second. Now it's getting data at a rate of 8 million samples per second. And, it's, and the way the FFT algorithm works, it uses a, an FFT size, which in this case is 1024, which means it's computing over 1024 adjacent samples at a time. And it's doing that 15 times per second, which means roughly 15,000 samples every second are getting analyzed. 15,000 out of 8 million isn't very much. <laughs> Which means that between every single frame that is graphically getting displayed on the screen, there is much, much more data that we're not visualizing at all. It's getting skipped all the time. And so this may be frustrating at times. You may think, why am I not seeing a packet? Because you really are. Um, or you would be if it were displaying all the data that it's getting. So a trick that I like to use is to dump stuff to a file instead of visualizing it on screen sometimes. All you have to do is take a file sync and I can connect it to the same output there and I'll just type a file name like um, temp osbrx and I'm going to just run this for a short period of time and just stop it. I just ran it for like a second or so. And we should see, uh, let me use this display here. I have this file called OSBRX. And notice that it is um, about 88 million bytes. How'd it get so big? <laughs> the reason it got so big, now I only ran it for a very short period of time, but um, the, the HackRF device, it produces 8 million samples per second. Each one is a byte, actually each one is two bytes because it's quadrature sampling. So it's a, a eight, 8 bits I and 8 bits Q if you're familiar with quadrature sampling. And um, so I should be getting like, what's that? Uh, two bytes, I should be getting like 16 megabytes per second coming over the USB, right? Now, um, in GNU radio, that's actually getting converted from bytes to floats, 32-bit floats, right? So, so I've just multiplied the amount by four. So every second, I'm saving 64 megabytes per second to my disk with this file sync, okay? This can easily, like if I, have, if I have this set to its maximum 20 million samples per second, I might be exceeding the limits of my disk right there, right? And I might have to use a RAM disk or something to save these samples to a file. Um, I'm actually going to try this again and see if I can get a little bit shorter because the software I'm about to show you likes to break. There, that's a little shorter. Uh, that's like one second worth. Um, and I'm going to visualize it using baud line, which which unfortunately is not open source, boo. Um, but it's a handy tool. Um, and I'm just going to configure it for 8 million 
baud line. Um, and I'm going to set it to interpret quadrature 32-bit floats. And here is the signal that I get out of it. And it's a spectrogram, which means this shows you information about frequency versus time. And the brighter color is a higher power. So you can clearly see the effect of our filter here. And basically all we're seeing, and I can kind of zoom in vertically, all we're seeing is just this filtered noise. Okay. Now let's try to add a signal to that noise. Let's go run the flow graph again with my phone scanning for Bluetooth devices. And I'll just run this for a second and open it up again in baud line, same file, same, oops, that didn't work. I got zero bytes. Was the file locked because the other I don't think so. Let me just try it again. Yeah, it likes it this time. There we go. Oh, and of course, this time my Bluetooth scan has stopped. Okay, I'm just going to reboot the HackerF just to be sure. Okay, scanning for Bluetooth devices, running a flow graph. Isn't this exciting? I love this stuff. And did I get anything good? Uh, Bodline also has this uh, waveform view which is a quick way to see that, no, I have no interesting peaks going on. Let me try this again. I may have just gotten unlucky. Not caught it at the right phase of the Bluetooth negotiation. Now things, uh, still actually isn't looking like I expect. Um, okay, I'm going to move on. The, because uh, we really don't have much time, and uh, I want to show you some cool stuff. So, um, one thing that I wish somebody told me about when I started with all this is that, uh, is data types. Like I mentioned, all these things are getting converted into floats uh, from, from bytes. And see how all these little ins and outs are blue? That indicates the data type. Now, if I go on and like try to demodulate this so that I can pull bits out of a Bluetooth packet, um, I could use like this modulator and take quadrature demod. Notice this one has two different colors. This takes this blue input and, and then outputs uh, orange, which is, uh, which is a float, instead of blue, which is complex. Um, in many cases, you can change the, the uh, output or input type, right? If you're a programmer, you're familiar with different data types. You probably know what a, what a short or an int is, more or less. You probably know what a float is, but what's complex? And hey, look at all of these. They're all complex. That's complex. This one's complex. They're all complex. Everything that's blue is complex. Every, up until the point where I was going to demodulate this to get bits out of, this, out of a packet, all my signals were complex value. So how many of you learned something about complex numbers in high school math or something like that? How many of you thought you'd never see them again in your life? <laughs> uh, the, the interesting thing here is that complex numbers are extremely useful in digital signal processing, and especially for digital signal processing of radio signals. So if you're going to get into SDR, you have to get comfortable with complex numbers. Now, there are whole books that try to explain DSP and try to explain software-defined radio avoiding complex numbers, and they are wrong, <laughs> okay? You need to embrace complex signals and get used to them. Let me show you an example. Um, like this signal source that I created, which was just, I told you it was just producing a, a generated waveform that I was multiplying by my other waveform. Let me show you an ex a simple example where I'll just take one of those um, waveform generators, signal, and notice the waveform that it's trying to produce is a cosine. I could change that to things like uh, square, triangle, whatever. I'm going to leave it at cosine, even though it's lying to me. And I'm going to um, 
I'm going to put it through a throttle block. Throttle is important because since this is a pure simulation, each block is going to run as fast as it possibly can. It's not limited by like the rate of bits coming from a piece of hardware. So if I don't throttle it, it's just going to run out of control and consume all my CPU time and make a really bad demo. Um, and then I'm going to uh, instrument it by, by uh, just doing a scope, which is like an oscilloscope. Uh, that's not what I wanted. A scope sync. And let me show you um, what this looks like. If I set, I'm, I'm going to set a slider to that is a um, that controls the frequency of my supposed cosine wave. I'll call it freak, and I'll set the default value. Yeah, sure, 50 hertz. Why not? And let's see, that should be about right. Um, Now, this is what the scope looks like. Notice that it does look like a cosine wave, right? But do you notice anything funny about it? There are two cosine waves. There's the blue one and the green one. What it's really giving me is not a cosine wave, but is a complex exponential, which means something that's rotating around a circle in two dimensions, right? If you only <coughs> took one of those dimensions, it looks like a cosine. And if you look at the other dimension, it looks like cosine, kind of out of phase. If we look down the axis and use an xy plot here, um, you can see it's kind of going around and around and around a circle. And um, it's a little bit skewed. <coughs> That's a little closer to a real circle just by adjusting the rulers. If I change the frequency uh, and make it much slower, I didn't. Well, that would explain a thing or two. Thank you. Then, now you can see my auto range is getting in my way a little bit. But here, it's going around and around the circle. And if I slow it down a lot, uh, you can see, I'd like, to, I'd like to have a little bit finer control there. I think I adjusted the wrong one. If I do the xy plot, then I'm plotting one of those values versus the other value. And you can see that as I slow this down, it's apparent that it's just going around and around and around the circle. Okay. So what does something look like if it's going around and around the circle? If I were to plot this in three dimensions, x versus y versus time, what figure would that trace? Um, a helix, like a slinky. What does a slinky look like if you look at it on edge? It looks like a sinusoid, right? Every time you see a sinusoidal figure in any kind of type of study of periodic function, think of it as a slinky in disguise. If you look at it, look at it from this side, it looks like a sinusoid. If you look at it from this side, it looks like a sinusoid also, except shifted in phase, just shifted over by 90 degrees, right? Which is exactly what we're seeing when we plot them both on the same axis. So uh, I'm running out of time, and uh, you know, obviously there's a lot more that we could look at, and, and I'd love to uh, chat with any of you around today and tomorrow uh, after the talk. If you're interested in this stuff, hopefully I've given you some ideas of the kinds of things that you'll start doing if you get into software-defined radio. Um, I'm hoping to have a commercial release of HackRF pretty soon, so I hope you'll keep your eye out for that. And I'd love to chat with you about any of your software-defined radio projects uh, that you might be interested in. And uh, so thanks for coming. And I have a bunch of stuff up here if people want. I have some Great Scott Gadget stickers. And I have my uh, Throwing Star Landtap business cards. And I think I hear my own voice coming from the back of the room where Jared has used his HackRF to tap into the wireless microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Operating at 500 and some megahertz. 563.3 <laughs> megahertz, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, so thanks, Jared, and thanks, everybody, for coming. <laughs>